But I think somebody like Tyreek Hill, that's exactly what Nick Sirianni wants to see. How do, how are we against somebody like this? You know, other than some teams, some other team's third string running back in a preseason game, you know, it isn't going to give you, you know, what you need to see to evaluate yourself. How are we doing against Tyreek Hill? If it's not good, then you need to really, uh, you know, get on some people and, and, and look at what how you're setting things up and, and go from there. Thursday edition of Birds 365. We got Jeff Curran for John McMullen today. Who's down in Miami to watch the Eagles practice. Not against the Dolphins, but just put in a practice today because the Dolphins have uh, decided, due to abundance of caution, some illness on the team, which means the Eagles got to keep the, an eye on their own players. Uh, there won't be a joint practice, so the Eagles will just practice by themselves and they get ready for the preseason game uh, between they and the uh, Eagles. The, Dolphins over the weekend. Here to talk about the birds and getting that much closer to the beginning of the regular season is one of our favorite guys who covers them, has been doing so for years, does a great job now for NJ.com and us whenever we ask them to come on Birds 365. Les Bowen jumps aboard. Uh, Les, are you ready for some football? Yeah, I think so, Jody. Uh, I'm kind of glad I'm not down there in Miami covering this mess uh, this morning. This uh, is really quite a thing to wake up to i think for everybody that made the trip down there uh, it's uh wow um you know the first thing everybody thinks about when a team says it's a non-covid illness and they're canceling a huge you know long planned uh uh joint practice is uh, monkeypox but apparently according to mike garofalo of the nfl network and i always assume that whatever the NFL network says is kind of official because it's the organ of the league, uh, is some kind of food poisoning or stomach bug that has ripped through the team. Now, they have 80 players. So for them not to be able to practice, I mean, if it's a stomach bug, you're not going to give it to the Eagles outside and on a field. Right. Uh, it, this, it just seems very, very odd to me. I, I hope this is all it is, and I hope uh, the Dolphins are fine. And, you know, I, I sure don't want to – if we did have an instance of monkeypox in the NFL, uh, you know, I don't know what the hell. We'd be going maybe back to where we were with COVID or something. Uh, but, uh, you know, all we know is that the Eagles aren't practicing with the Dolphins, and uh, – you know, we don't know anything about the game Saturday or anything. But, uh, but yeah, I'm ready for some football uh, in the unlikely event that we should get some. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Les, the first thing I thought of when I, I got the text this morning, like, whoa, okay, last time we had something this major, like a practice or a game getting canceled, the, the, the whole world shut down. So uh, yes. Yes. I was thinking the same thing, you know, maybe monkey pox, maybe this. But I'm just hoping that it is food poisoning or the Eagles pack their lunches. Let's just say that. Yeah, yeah. Some bad crabs or something, you know, from, yeah. yeah. None of us know for sure. So, yeah, we get to speculate from afar uh, all day long. Uh, rather than look forward to what they're missing out on by not having a joint practice and or if there will be any issues with Saturday's game, we can't do anything about that because it hasn't been decided yet. We looked back at yesterday. Eagles got ripped up pretty good by the Dolphin offense, Tyree Gill being the main guy uh, to torch the Eagles. But uh, to it, Tunga Valoa, after a lot was made, less of uh, quarterbacks against the Eagles completing 80% of their passes, Tua was closer to 90% of his passes yesterday. Um, is Tua better than some people think? Or is the Eagles secondary not as good as some people think? I, yeah, I'm not going to take a lot of uh, hard and fast uh, evaluations out of this. I don't, I don't believe I was not there. Jeff was, but I don't believe they had Bradbury yesterday, right? No, uh, he's no, still he uh, recovering from that groin injury. So you know, um, they the Eagles do have a concern at safety, though. I think uh, Marcus Epps, I think, is a solid guy to have. I don't know if he's a like an A or B starter, but he's a, he's a guy, you know, uh, Harris at the other safety, they sort of brought him back this year because they didn't have a lot of options. 
he was just sort of barely okay last year with Rodney McLeod back there with him. He doesn't have Rodney McLeod this year. Uh, I still think they could make a move at safety. Um, as far as Tua, great potential. Uh, a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of argument over who he's going to be and what he's going to be in the NFL. Um, we all know that he unseated Jalen Hurts at Alabama. And Jalen had to go finish his career at Oklahoma. Um, you know, I don't have a good read on exactly who Tua is going to be. I, I do think he has a lot of arm talent. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of factors yesterday. I, the way this is set up for the Eagles, Jody and Jeff, they're never going to do it like this again. To have back-to-back -back weeks with them being the visitor in joint practices, traveling to Cleveland and then coming home for like one day, literally one and a half days, and then flying to Miami and doing it again. I, I you know, you want the work, but you don't want to be the team that's, you know, uh, the traveling road show. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, they're, they're down there. It's, it's really, really, really hot as I understand. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, it's not a great situation for them in terms of being at peak performance. But I think somebody like Tyreek Hill, that's exactly what Nick Sirianni wants to see. How do, how are we against somebody like this? You know, other than some teams, some other teams, third string running back in a preseason game, you know, that isn't going to give you, you know, what you need to see to evaluate yourself. How are we doing against Tyreek Hill? If it's not good, then you need to really, uh, you know, get on some people and, and, and look at what, how you're setting things up and, and go from there. Plus, you mentioned the safety position. Uh, you brought up your Ugo Amati. I mean, the Eagles traded him nine days after they acquired him. You were in Cleveland last week. What did you see or not see from him? Oh, he was just fine. But you got him for uh, J.J. Ortega Whiteside. And apparently somebody who is desperate for a safety said, hey, we've always liked to go Amadi. We've played against him. Uh, how about we give you a sixth round pick for him? And that and the Eagles said, sure. <laughs> um, I don't think it was I don't think we know yet whether he would have made the team or made the practice squad or whatever. But he's a guy, you know, that's kind of floated around a little bit. And uh, I think they jumped on the, the opportunity to have a pick. I don't think he was going to make a difference here. I, I guess I would say that, Jeff. He could have made the team, but he's like a lot of guys they have. And I think that's a problem in the secondary right now. They have a lot of guys who are NFL players, you know, but when it comes, push comes to shove and you're, you know, covering an elite receiver or an elite tight end, uh, you're at a bit of a disadvantage with some of those guys. I think it's another one you got to put in the W column for Howie Roseman to be able to turn around and flip him and move up around from a seven to a six for a guy who was here less than a week that you got for a guy who wasn't making a team, J.J. Arcega Whiteside, I think is Howie playing the uh, Monty Hall, let's make a deal cards pretty darn well. Now, if Amadi goes to Tennessee and actually steps in and plays for them and the Eagles continue to have the questions that they have in their secondary, oh, we can oh, yeah. revisit this and say, Howie, what would you do? You didn't even give the guy a chance. He was only here nine days. Give him a chance. Well, but as that's, a, that's an excellent point, Jody. And, and it wasn't Howie who did it. But uh, in the Chip Kelly era, the Eagles drafted Jordan Poyer, yeah. who is now one of the top He's safeties still. in the league. <laughs> And Chip tried to get him onto the practice squad at the end of uh, training camp, and that didn't work. And, uh, you know, they drafted Jordan Poyer in, like, the seventh round. And, you know, they got nothing from – never played a game for the – Wasn't it Cleveland that claimed Jordan Poyer? I think so, yes. Now he's with Buffalo. But, yeah, he is, you know. <laughs> and it was apparent in training camp that the guy could play, but they thought they were being smart or something. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. So you don't want that to happen. You don't want Ugo Amadi to go out there and, you know, reinvent the safety position. But assuming he doesn't, I think it was a pretty good move. Right. Uh, here's what does scare me a little bit. And you and Jeff both touched on the safety position. And I understand that because 
you've got uh, either an only okay starter uh, step ho- that you're hoping is is stepping up. Uh, Epps last year was not a starter for this team, and now he is probably safety number one. Um, Kayvon Wallace just hasn't lived up to expectations yet. Jaquaski uh, Tart had a couple of nice hits in the game the other day, but uh, there's a reason why he hasn't run with the first team all preseason long, had some injury issues, but he hasn't ever been elevated to the first team. I get everybody's concern for the safety. I've got the same. Again, yesterday, the guys who were making plays downfield uh, were, were against cornerbacks. And I know Slay got pulled early, and Bradbury went out, uh, has been out with an injury and didn't practice yesterday. He was there, but limited stuff, not in the 11-on-11s. Is cornerback depth where Hugo was traded from? Um, I know he's listed as a safety, but the Eagles plugged him in for the week and a half that they had him more as a slot corner. Is the cornerback depth on this team a question mark just in case there are some injuries to Slay and uh, Bradbury and they do have to lean on their bench to get them through some games this year, Les? Well, I think that's a good point. It probably is. Uh, I would also say, though, for what team isn't it? I mean, who has backup corners that are real good? Uh, you know, that's that's not a thing, really. Uh, those guys get paid a lot of money. And when they get good, they're either starting for you or they're going somewhere else unless you, you know, draft a bunch of them and they turn out to be great. But, you know, it, yeah, and that happens to the Eagles a lot. You know, many times we've gone into seasons thinking, boy, they look good at this position. And then by – game five you're watching guys that they pulled off the street you know trying to play and that happened at corner several years ago uh during the jim schwartz era they were literally bringing guys in and practicing them two days and starting them against drew Brees and stuff you know uh, you know that's that's uh and they actually craven leblanc was one of those guys who was a pretty solid uh, addition to the team for a while so you know but, yeah, it, it is a concern. Uh, the Eagles haven't drafted a good corner since 2002 with Lido Shepard and Sheldon Brown. That was the last time they devoted a first-round pick to the position. Uh, they, they have used second-round picks, most notably, most recently, on Sidney Jones in 2017. He's not here anymore. He's out there with Hugo, you know, in Seattle. Um I, you know, it's uh, it, yeah, it's a concern because they they kind of have not done well at that position over the years in evaluating it from a draft perspective. They had Rasul Douglas. They drafted Rasul Douglas, who in a very different scheme in Green Bay has turned into a very useful player and is, uh, you know, making money out there in Green mm-hmm. Bay as a starter. Uh, I don't know what it is, but, uh, you know, we can't blame that on Gannon because I don't think Gannon never had Rasul. They traded him, you know, or he went on in free agency before the previous, the, the current regime was in place. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a concern. And, uh, you know, that they, they are going to have to be healthy at, at, at a position like that in order to be uh, a solid, solid defense. Les, I seem to be one of the few that isn't concerned about running back. I, I think Boston Scott and Kenny Gainwell are more than fine, especially behind that Eagles offensive line. But do you think they need to upgrade there? I don't know about upgrade. They could probably use a little bit more reinforcements. Um, I don't think it much matters. They are not going to have a run-based offense. This year. If they do, it's a huge failure. I mean, they've got A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith and Dallas Goddard. And if they need to lean on their running game to run the offense, I, I don't know what that says. But, you yeah, that it would be nice. I mean, you could always use an elite running back. But I don't think there's that much difference in the league. I think you can pick up a guy that can help you. They've done this time in. You know, this is something – unfortunately, running backs are a pretty fungible commodity, uh, unfortunately for them, for running backs. Uh you can find a guy. I'm sure they will find a guy. I don't think they're that happy. Kenny Gainwell still has kind of been up and down, and he's a he's a really small running back. He's not, and he's not built like Boston Scott is a small running back, but he's built really sturdy. 
you know, uh, like Darren Sproles was, Gainwell really isn't built that way. And he's kind of in and out and up and down. Uh, I would not be surprised to see them add to that group. But do I think it's a huge deal? No, I agree with you. Here's where I got to give it at least some concern, Les, uh, because how many times we've said this about Miles Sanders over the last couple of years, his biggest ability is his availability, and it's just yeah. not always there. And yeah. sure enough, right now it's not there. And I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest he's not playing in this weekend's game. They're not going to risk him against the Dolphins. So we're coming in kind of like questioning as to what Miles Sanders' role is going to be, how good he's going to be. That's Miles' biggest problem. I know that he's got some holes in his game, but uh, it's all outweighed by the fact that he's always dealing with some kind of injury and the Eagles are going to be walking on eggshells with him again as the season starts for another season. Uh, that's why I give uh, Jeff a chance of being right about this, that they do if they're going to go uber aggressive for an, uh, a trade and do something before the season starts, it might very well be running back. It could be. Um with Miles, I mean, that's they know who he is. That That's why he doesn't have a contract past yeah. this season. And he's not going to get one. <laughs> I mean, maybe if he gained 2,000 yards this year, he'd get one or something. But, you know, it, he's playing for his next team. Uh, it's uh, it, That's pretty apparent at this point uh, when they didn't uh, sign him to a new deal. So, you know, I they could trade for a, a back. But, I, again, there's going to be guys, names, you know, guys that you've heard of that are going to be available in the cut to 53. Or if, you know, if you don't want to take a chance on waivers or whatever, you can, hey, we'll give you a, that six-round draft pick that we just got for Ugo Hamadi. How about your, running, your backup running back for that? You know, I mean, I just don't think they need a uh, – I'm not sure they need an elite running back to do what they need to do. Plus, you've covered the Eagles for – what now two decades uh, you've seen their issues at wide receiver but we've been talking about how deep this core is i, I now look I, I think the 2004 core with to was really good i think mm-hmm. the 2006 core was underrated obviously we know how good jackson and mackerel were but is this the deepest core you've seen of uh, wide receivers yes yeah i think so uh when you you know rager is a talented guy i mean he's you know it's it's never quite translated to the field, but he's, he's a good, good talent. Uh, you know, Quez Watkins, I think a lot of people, I know Mike Quick is, is huge on Quez Watkins. He thinks he should be, you know, a marquee player at some point. Then you've got, you know, Devonte is uh, a first round pick, a high first round pick and a guy who looks every bit of that. A.J. Brown is usually the dominant player on the field whenever the Eagles are practicing. Even if they're practicing against the Browns last week, I thought that was the case. Um, and then you, you have guys like Hightower still running. You have Deion Kane. Real interesting story. Guy I've kind of been watching all through camp. Uh, former Clemson player, you know, national championship era player. Uh, came to Clemson as a quarterback. Uh, They had Deshaun Watson at the time, and he wasn't uh, apparently getting any massages. So, you know, Deion Cain decided he wasn't going to be the quarterback at Clemson and switched to wide receiver. Uh, He was a five-star recruit. He's a tall, reasonably fast guy with great hands, good body control. Uh, He's bounced around a little bit. He had a bad injury his rookie year with Tennessee. Uh, yeah, I think he should be on the team. I think they're going to carry six wideouts. I think so and I think if they did get somebody hurt there, they could probably, you know, they wouldn't be as good, obviously, if you lose like a Devontae or something like that for a while. You're not going to be as good. But they could run their offense with, with a lot of the guys they have in camp right now. Let's say uh, both you guys are right in there, uh, well, uh, for conversational purposes that you guys are wrong, that they're not carrying six. They're only carrying five. Mm. And they have to make a call between Kane and Rager. There's no question in my mind Kane has been better this preseason than Rager has. I know a lot more goes into it than just who's been the best over the last five weeks. But if they have started to feel better about Kane and want to keep him, Les, what's the least the Eagles would take in exchange for Rager? What's the... 
what's the bottom line? If someone offers them a seventh round pick, they're going to say no. Sixth round pick, they're probably going to say no. Fifth round pick, fourth round pick. Where do you think Howie Roseman draws the line? I need to get at least this in exchange for trading Jalen Rager. Boy, that's a real good question, Jody. I'm not sure there is a a, a bottom line there. It, just because you're talking about six plus million dollars off the salary cap, and the team that acquires him is going to have to pay that money and have that room. So you don't think and, there's there, there's any deal for Rager out there right now that there's not a team that would say, yeah, costs us next to nothing is. His salary is too much for us to take a chance on. Exactly. I think that's I think that's the problem. I think there there's got to be somebody that can use him. But do they want to spend that kind of money on him? Uh, and, of course, he's not under contract after this year. So, you know, you'd have to do a contract if he actually played well for you or, or let him go into free agency. Um, it'll be real interesting to see what happens with that. The, the, set, the scenario you set up, with only one spot for the two guys, I would certainly go with Kane. I just I don't trust Rager after having seen some of the things he's done in games, the the drops he's had. The, you know, I just don't. He's had a very good training camp, but we've seen that before. There's just something there. Some people perform in games, and some people don't. We don't know that Deion Kane will, but I'm much. I'd be much happier taking a shot on at that than rolling Rager out there yet again and trying to see if, you know, if, if he'll, if, if suddenly he's figured it out. Um, if he does figure it out for somebody else, then God bless him. You know, I think, uh, I think the Eagles went about as far as they could with him. Let me, let me uh, follow up, Jeff. Thanks. Um, here's uh, what a uh, uh, sideline conversation we had yesterday. Um, maybe it was with Rob Marty. I'm not sure. Um, the argument was made that they need to keep Rager because of special teams. I know he's capable of catching punts and or kickoffs. He hadn't been good at either one of them. Yeah. Uh, if he's on the team and he's playing some wide receiver, I get it. Uh, you got to keep him or a cubby. You got, somebody's got to be their return guy right. who, who factors into the mix. Is he that good just because he can catch punts or kicks? Would that difference be enough for the Eagles to say, well, we can't trade him because he's a return guy too? No, I, I don't think that's a fact. I don't think so either. I, I didn't understand that yesterday. Yeah. They have three or four guys that can do that. Um, when I think of somebody being good on special teams, I think about a guy like Ike Reese. You know, that's what you're yeah. that's what's valuable on special teams is somebody who makes plays as a tackler or a blocker uh, who goes in and blocks punts and stuff like that, a returner, you know, you can always find somebody that can return for you. You don't want to go into a season with a bunch of guys who have never done it before because the Eagles did that once. I think everybody remembers, uh, I believe it was 2010 in green Bay where they lost their opener because they cut all the returners and they decided to try to give uh a couple guys a shot. He really hadn't ever done it. Greg Lewis and uh, one other guy. Oh, se oh uh, seven. I remember Greg Lewis muffed that punt. And yeah, uh, they scored. it was uh, it was a disaster. Uh, it, you know, it they lost. They literally lost the game because they couldn't return kicks and punts. Um, but you know that doesn't. That's happened once in twenty years that I've been watching the team. Uh, I think I think you have guys like Gainwell. You have you know. There's plenty of guys on this team you can put back there and and return some uh, return some kicks. Plenty of good athletes who have done this at some point in their football lives, and it's not complicated. It's not like you have to learn the scheme to run back a punt. You know, you could pick up somebody the day before the season and, and have them run back punt. I believe it was Rio Mahe, by the way, they cut less. I, I think Reno. that's yeah. Well, they, that was the Jeremy Bloom year, whatever that, year that was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they cut Jeremy Bloom, but they had like three other guys. They had a new special teams coach, Rory Segrist. Yeah, because Harbaugh, uh, Harbaugh had moved on to defensive backs. And Rory Segrist, every, every time at Lehigh, we were asking him who his returners were, and he would mention all these guys, and I would think, none of those guys is going to make the team. They're not, you know, they're like the eighth 
corner and the 12th safety and the 14th running back. You know, they're, <laughs> they're not going to be here, Rory. You know, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So, Les, I, I have to ask you this. I'm, I was going to save this for Barrett, but I'll ask you since we're talking about these fringe guys here. Who wins your Freddie Solomon, Raheem Mostert award, Paul Turner, the one guy you do not want to see cut from this football team? Well, we just talked about Deion Cain. That's the guy that I think has made the biggest splash uh, offensively. Let me think about this a second. I wasn't expecting this question. Um, some of the defensive linemen uh, that I didn't really – that weren't really on my radar, uh, that guy Kobe Smith, whoever the heck he is, he really had a good game uh, in Cleveland, I thought. He's this sort of – He's, he's listed at 6'2", 300. I think the 6'2 might be a little bit of a lie. He's kind of a stubby defensive tackle who, uh, you know, I see him making plays. Uh, there are, there, there's a several guys on this team that really, uh, I think they did a good job finding guys that nobody ever heard of that really, you know, are there more than just as, as fodder for practice. Guys that could, you see some traits in them. I, I like him. I like Kane. Uh, I'll probably go with those two. Fair enough. Uh, Les Bone here with us on Birds 365. We've done about 20-some-odd minutes already, and we have not mentioned Jalen Hurts once. We haven't done too many shows if that's been the case this offseason. Uh, so I got to get your thoughts on the Eagles QB. Yesterday, he completed a high percentage of his passes. Seemed like a lot of checkdowns. He was great in the first preseason game, right down the field, eight plays, touchdown. Uh, his practice work has been up and down, stock up and down. Um, how good do you feel about him coming into this season as compared to when last season ended? When last we saw Jalen Hurts in a yeah. game that mattered, he was getting his tail kicked by the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers in last year's playoffs. Nice. As we sit here today, less significantly better, slightly better. Nothing's changed in my mind. Jody, I'm worried that he's actually gone backwards. What's your evaluation on Jalen Hurts today here on August 25th? Right now, I would say slightly better, Jody. But I don't, you know, we're not going to know until he plays one of these good teams. And, you know, and we have a, we're going to need a little bit of time for the offense and A.J. Brown and all that to kind of come together. You know, it might be midseason before we really have a good idea of what's going on there. But I I don't see any reason to think that he's going backwards. I think that's I, – I would throw that right off the, the plate. Uh, he had a really – there was a moment last week in Cleveland when he got some pressure from his right side and rolled left. And this has been a problem. Last year, if you look at the, some of these analytics things, they chart exactly where the ball goes. Jalen Hurts could only really throw the ball effectively to his right side. He did not – throw much over the middle at all, and he was not accurate to the left side. So he's rolling to his left under pressure. And, of course, they're not going to really hit him, but, you know, he's under pressure. And he finds A.J. Brown like 20 yards downfield, throws on a dead run and hits him in stride. And it's, you know, they've broken off the pattern. So this is the two of them just improvising. And they haven't had that much time together yet. But it worked perfectly, and the pass was perfect. And I thought, yeah, that's the kind of thing you want to see this year from Jalen Hurts. Same with the touchdown. It was one play. It was one yeah, play. one play. But, but, you know, I mean, I don't see any reason to say that he's not improved. But we don't know yet. I mean, I, you know that he's worked hard on it. You know that he's taken the criticisms to heart and that he's, uh, you know, done everything he can. The question is how much, you know, a lot of this is – vision and uh processing stuff and it's not an intelligence question you know carson wentz is an incredibly intelligent guy but he doesn't process real well you know second and third reads and things like that it's just something you can either do or you can't do sometimes and and i don't know we'll just have to see i think if he's here's where i think the evaluation is tricky and i'll shut up in a second the offense is going to be so good. They have so many weapons. Even if he's not any better than he was last year, the offense will work. That's the question you have to really look at. You have to look at how he's going to play against the really good defenses because 
I think their offense is going to score points, whether he's any better or not, you know, uh, and that's what's going to get a little tricky in this evaluation. He's going to have some numbers that his defenders can point to and say, he did this, he did that. But there still might be a little bit of uneasiness, like, yeah, did, was he really, you know, did he did he head to head against a great quarterback? Was he was he as good as the great quarterback? You know, I, I think that's where the evaluation is going to get really sticky. Plus, we know about the tight end position. We know Dallas Goddard's going to be one. Jack Stoll's going to be two. But I'm still concerned here. I, I don't know who's going to be the three. Is it going to be Grant Calcaterra? Is it going to be Noah? Uh, I can I can never pronounce his last name. Togi. Togi. They can't even pronounce in the press box. <laughs> Togi. Yeah. So, I mean, who do you think it's going to be? Who do you think deserves that job? I really like Calcaterra. He missed an awful lot of camp with a he hamstring did. injury. And the story on him is he was available really late in the draft because he quit football for a while because of concussions. He was a guy that when he started his career at Oklahoma, he was on a track to be like a second round pick, you know, like, which is, you know, most tight ends aren't first round picks, but you know, he was, he was going to be an elite guy and he quit because of concussions and then came back and played a year without having a concussion, but it's still a little bit of a gray area as to, you know, this is something he had a problem with more than once. Could it come back again? I don't know. But uh, he had a hamstring early in this camp and took a long time to get over that. But he has jumped right back in and done very well. And I'm pretty comfortable. You're talking the third tight end. You know, you're not talking about starting him. I- I'm pretty comfortable with him as a third tight end. Togi has been around a while. I think you can put him back on the practice squad where he's been before. Yeah, the good camp, though. Yeah, yeah great kid. You know. Uh, nothing wrong with having him around, but uh, I would. Calcaterra's got real. He's got potential beyond, you know, being a deep backup. <laughs> he yeah. actually has athleticism and and uh, pass catching ability that you would look for in a guy who's, you know, starting or playing a lot. And I'd like to see them develop that. Less two guys' names have been kicked around more than anybody else with the Eagles this preseason as potential trade uh, guys uh, have been Rager and Dillard, and understandably so. First round picks who have no path to being major contributors, yeah. uh, more so on the Dillard side because Myelata has developed into one of the best left tackles. Um, Rager just hasn't been able to get past what the Eagles have put in front of him in the wide receiver position. Um, Dillard's a good left tackle. There are teams in this league, you yes. put him on their roster right now, he's a starting left tackle. If one of those teams are interested and want to acquire him, same question I had about Rager, what's the bottom line? What's the cutoff? If someone wants to try and steal him from the Eagles, how he's going to say no, and they're just going to keep him as their backup left tackle. But if someone offers enough, how he likes to do deals, what's the price that a team's going to have to pay if they want to take Andre Dillard off the Eagles' hands? Dillard for Kareem Hunt, Jody. (laughs) No, I don't know. That's not happening. We had a Cleveland guy on last week. I know another (laughs) Cleveland guy. They said, Hunt's not being traded. People are are creating this deal. The Browns are keeping him. They're not dealing him. Yeah, I don't know what the bottom line would be. For me, it would be like a third-round pick. I mean, I would certainly – I do think Dillard is a starting left tackle in the NFL. I don't know if he's going to be like a Pro Bowl left tackle. But you don't give away starting left tackles. Uh, and I'm always a little leery with offensive linemen because I've seen years, again, where the Eagles have had like four of their five injured. Right. The, the fact that Dillard hasn't – shown any positional versatility is a problem because normally you would say well okay if my lot is healthy what about uh, what if dickerson goes down or what if uh, the right tackle blaine johnson has a problem but dillard hasn't shown that ability to jump into those spots now we're basing that on how he looked a few years ago I, maybe he's developed to the point where he could do that now i, I don't know but I think he's a good player. I wouldn't be in a hurry to get him out of here. Uh, you know, I, to me, third round, second round, something like that. And I doubt anybody's going to do that, frankly. Um, 
somebody's going to be desperate. Somebody, it's going to have to be like a, a, a the, the situation the Eagles had with uh, uh, Sam Bradford, you know, where suddenly the Vikings needed a quarterback right before this, the season started. Somebody, a good team, a contender. Might be, might be the Cowboys. <laughs> gets Yeah, you know, I don't think that Smith injury is that serious. But, yeah, it's somebody, a good team, loses their left tackle. And it's like, oh, my God, you know, we're a playoff team with a left tackle and we don't have a left tackle. You know, that's that's what's going to get it done. I'm not sure that's out there. Well, I think the Cowboys are at that. Uh, Smith looks like a, they're, they're caught in a couple of months. Now they'll probably move their first round draft pick who they were planning on playing a guard. Uh, back yeah. out to uh, tackle because that's where he played on the Maybe so. Right? That would be a yeah. huge twist for Andre Dillard, everything he's been through, to have to come back here as a Dallas Cowboy. That would really be uh, the I, icing I was going to use the left right. tackle right now with that offensive line. It's I mean, I didn't hear good things about them throughout camp, but now you got this the, – their rock of their offensive line, the one guy they were counting on to be healthy. He's already missed, what, 10 games over the last two years? It's not good. Yeah. And and I don't even know if Howie would pull the trigger on that one. All right, last, last question. And thank you very much for doing this with us again today. Uh, don't know if we're going to have you on before the season gets underway. We're definitely going to get you back on as soon as it's shortly thereafter. But if we don't get you on before the first week in the next 17 days, at Detroit, week one, a lot of people here on Birds 365, including my usual co-host and several other guests that we've had, are trepidatious about the Lions. That you'd, you'd yes. rather play them later in the year than early in the year. They don't know they're going to be bad yet. Uh, Dan Campbell's got them whipped into a frenzy on hard don't knocks. Mess with Deuce Staley, Jody. I'm telling you, don't mess Deuce with him. Deuce Staley is going to motivate these Lions to a level where they're going to be able to potentially pick off the birds as a favorite week one. On the road, but less than four, like three and a half point favorite. Not like the Eagles are favored by two touchdowns. If it were two touchdowns, I might still lay it. I think the Eagles are going to go in there and lay yeah. waste to the Lions. Maybe not to the level of 44 to six like last year, but how worried is Les Bowen about the Eagles opening week opponents? You know, I'm hearing a lot of that stuff. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I think, uh, Detroit has some talent, uh, I think, uh, on the lines. Uh, you know, it's – I'm not sure I would bet a lot of money on, on the Eagles on this game. I Openers tend to be squirrely. Thank you. Strange things happen in openers uh, all, the, all the time. I'm going to go in assuming the Eagles are going to win, but, you know, it could be really gnarly. It could be – an up and down game. Uh, I, it's in Detroit. Uh, it, you know, I, I don't feel great about it. I, I think uh, you don't. If the Eagles go into it thinking they're playing, you know, forty-four to six, and you know, we'll just do that again. I think they're in huge trouble. Uh, but I don't think uh, Goff is that good a QB. I think uh, you know. I think I, I think the Eagles should be able to to get out of there with a win, but I don't have, as far as two touchdowns, I'm not ready to, to jump on that yet. Double digits. Remember, you okay. heard it here first. All righty. Double digits, and yeah, maybe two touchdowns. If it's true, it's because the line secondary outside of Tracy Walker is not very good. Yeah, yeah there you go. Uh, That's there. true, yeah. I'm not worried about squarely, other than the fact that I can get a little squarely. Uh, Les, great stuff. Always a pleasure, my friend. Appreciate it. Uh, you know we'll get you back in a couple of weeks. Thanks for hopping in with us today. Thank you. And stay away from uh, stomach bugs or monkey pox or yeah, all that stuff. Uh, that's, not to get, that's, that's my goal for the rest of the day is not to get monkey pox. Uh, that's Les Bowen. From <laughs>